Okay, welcome everybody to the RFP review. Um, we're going to go through the uh, basics of our grants and what they are, and we're going to go all the way to how to apply for one of our grants using an entirely new application form uh, that's just getting started in round 19. So affordable materials grants are what we used to call textbook transformation grants, but we're including all course resources in this new title. And there are two types. This used to be a standard scale and large scale grant and a mini grant. Now there are two different functions. Uh, transformation grants are about transforming courses, um, taking OER and uh, other affordable or completely no cost to students resources and replacing an expensive commercial textbook in your classroom. Um, these can be single course, these can be multi-course, um, and now we can scale these up from uh, one person on the grant all the way up to uh, a max of 30,000 uh, for the entire thing. Um, the continuous improvement grants are what we used to call mini grants. They are opportunities to improve previously created OER, uh, to create ancillary materials to support different open textbooks, uh, maybe even uh, compose your own yourself, but that's kind of on the higher side of things. Um, the way that this is done is by supporting the time that it takes to get uh, your project off the ground. How that time is funded does vary by institution. And we're saying this right up front because as we talk about how these grants can help, they will vary depend on, depending on where you are. Uh, different places will have different policies. So it's just kind of a disclaimer uh, right on the first slide. So the round 19 request for proposals uh, is up and running and I will link you to it in the chat going like this. And this round 19 page gives you all of the documentation that you need, uh, not only to apply, but to understand how the whole process works. Um, it has the description of what the grants are. It includes the examples that are also on the RFP uh, documents, the Word document. And then it differentiates between the transformation grants and uh, continuous improvement grants before going into the main big RFP document. The uh, two different rubrics that are used in order to um, review these by peer reviewers. And then the word version of the transformation grant form and the word version of the continuous improvement form, which do need to be completed. Uh, there is the online form, but you are using your word application form in that process. Uh, one thing I'm going to do real quick is um, just mute the participants so that we don't have a lot of ambient noise. Uh, you can always unmute your mic if you want to ask a question. Here we go. Bringing chat back in. Uh, so March 1st is the application deadline for this RFP. We got it out there before the holiday season so that people could take a look at it early. Um, March 2nd is when peer reviews start. So we um, assign a group of peer reviewers to all of these applications after the deadline passes. And they have two weeks to look at this and give their thoughts based on the rubrics that are on that page. Um, the notifications get sent out the day after uh, all of these reviews get back. Uh, so we have a few days in there for administrative review as well. So we want to make sure that everything lines up, that there's uh, nothing that goes against the guidelines, um, as well as making sure that uh, if you're giving impact numbers that those line up fine, uh, so we're not reporting incorrect data. And then um, when those notifications go out, if you are selected, you would want to start your asynchronous training right at that time, and we will link you to that training. Uh, the kickoff used to be in person, this big kickoff meeting. It took place at Middle Georgia State. Um, it, you know, it's a nice central location. It's, it's tough for everybody who isn't in Macon to get there sometimes, but Every place is somewhat hard to get to. It's just an equally hard to get to place. And it was great to meet everyone in person. Uh, the tough thing is we really can't do that right now due to COVID-19. And having a six hour uh, online kickoff meeting is also uh, a 
a heck of a slog to get through. So what we're doing instead is we're doing all of the uh, training stuff, getting used to the fundamentals of what OER are, copyright, that kind of thing all takes place on the asynchronous training. You complete that stuff um, using some Google Forms to just kind of say that, yes, you took this uh, a little bit of a check your knowledge type of thing on there. Um, and then we have the online kickoff, which is an online meeting synchronously so that we can all get to know each other, get to know our projects and do stuff in person that you really can't do on, you know, just doing some training on a website. So we've broken it up quite a bit. Uh, it's not a six hour kickoff meeting anymore. Um, at least one team member on every transformation grants team not, uh, needs to be in the online kickoff meeting for continuous improvement grants. You don't have to be in the online kickoff meeting if you don't want to, but it is still highly recommended uh, if you want to participate. And you all have to uh, complete the asynchronous training. Each team member does. So we, we say all of this about the kickoff during the timeline because you do have to make sure you mark off March 26th as the date for the online kickoff meeting. So when it comes to our grants, we have these two different categories. We're going to go a little bit more in depth into what that means. For a transformation grant, which is the ones where you are transforming your courses from having a commercial resource to having low cost slash no cost resources, um, there are specific funding guidelines for that. So for our awards, it is a maximum of $5,000 per individual team member, and that can cover things like um, uh, overload pay, course release, uh, things like professional development and travel. Some institutions will only cover professional development with these grants, so you'll have to check with your grants office to make sure that what your plan is is feasible. Um, there are also additional project expenses that you can put into these grants, not just for your time. You can um, have materials in your budget, but they need to be justified within the application. So if you're going to have uh, three new laptops as part of a grant, you would really need to explain why you need those. Um, it's not very common that uh, that there are heavy additional project expenses on these grants. It's usually covering the time primarily. Um, but yeah, every so often someone had uh, created, for example, uh, a lab in physics where they used an Arduino chip, and that was really neat. It's a whole chip on a system. And so they needed a few of those to just get it going and to teach it in class. That That's a really cool way to uh, use the additional project expenses. So grants can be as small as 5,000 or even less if you are not taking the maximum per individual team member if you have one team member, or as big as $30,000. And depending on how big that project is and how many team members there are, that budget reflects the plan that you have overall. So it should all be pretty integrated and connected. Uh, you should have the plan first, then you plan out the budget for it. Now, if you have other project costs, you can use them uh, like equipment, travel, authoring tools, etc. Just be sure to make it very clear to reviewers. And that's one thing that I'm always going to say here is keep peer reviewers in mind when you're writing these. If you have a question about what you should or should not include, think of peer reviewers looking at the rubric and then looking at your application. Is it very clear why you have a certain expense in there? Good, then, that's, then that one belongs. So how can you use transformation grants? Uh, one of the things that we got some feedback on a while back is that we were describing these grants uh, in terms of how they worked, but we never really gave any examples as to how you could do it. Um, one way of doing a transformation project of any sort is by adopting open educational resources and other resources that are out there. Adopting just means you are bringing them into the course and you are using them as is. Uh, so OpenStax Sociology is a comprehensive sociology resource for uh, intro sociology. And you could bring that text in, and that is adopting that text. You're not customizing it in any way. You're not breaking it up and separating it into only the chapters that you need. It is just there to use. Um, you could still have ancillary materials that you wind up creating as an adoption project, though. For example, you'd want your lecture slides to... 
line up with what you're uh, teaching, of course. And you want your tests and quizzes, of course, to line up with the structure of your class, which may um, take a different kind of spin when you're looking at a different uh, set of materials. So adoption sounds like it's something very simple, bringing in no cost resources, but there's still a lot of design work to be done. Uh, taking an in-depth look at what you would need to do when you're adopting these materials uh, is something that you should do before you apply. Uh, something that should be very clear in the application that you've you've looked at these materials and you're like, okay, in order to make this possible in our courses, we need to do a, B, and C over here, and here's how it's going to happen. That's a really cool way to get those proposals done is to already do that selection and then go into it. Uh, you could customize uh, your open resources. For example, uh, one team did take Apex Calculus and tailored it to only what uh, the Armstrong campus of Georgia Southern University was doing in calculus, and they named it Armstrong Calculus. Uh, revision, so maybe you have found a really cool open resource for your course, but you've got some issues with a couple of chapters um, and you want to fix those issues. You totally can due to the nature of open and revision would be the work that you're doing to make a new, uh, I wouldn't say addition because that's too much, but to make a new version of this textbook for your particular course. You could also entirely create um, using a textbook transformation grant. You could get a team together to create an entire open textbook. We have the University of North Georgia Press who can help you with things like copy editing and graphic design. Um, they can also facilitate a double blind peer review process. Um, you could make library reading lists. Uh, Galileo has a lot of resources and especially in upper level courses. Um, creating lists of various materials to read instead of just a single comprehensive textbook might be the way to go. And there are plenty of low cost materials out there. We talk about OER a lot because it's very effective. It's a it's a big way that everybody does this here in the USG, but that's not the only one uh, that you can do that with. Continuous improvement grants are the mini grants of old. Um, there are uh, there's a maximum that is lower than the maximum for a transformation grant. This is just for the revision and creation of OER. Um, it's 2000 maximum per team member for what your institution does permit. Um, additional project expenses, again, they are allowed, but you need to make sure that they're clear in the proposal um, how they're going to be used. And then the maximum for these is $10,000. So mini grants used to be only up to $4,800. That included um, an optional $800 in project expenses and uh, $2,000 maximum for, for participants. So it only really went up to uh, two team members using the max amount of the budget. So now what we can do is expands these a bit to get as big as $10,000. That allows uh, larger teams to create more impactful stuff. We get a lot of feedback from the mini grant saying, well, we really would have loved to do a lot more with this, but we couldn't bring team members on because of it. So the difference between the old mini grants and the new continuous improvement grants is the teams can be bigger. And yeah, um, a major adaptation, a substantial improvement of the materials is uh, th that's something that's what we're talking about with improvement. We're not going to say, uh, OK, well, here's a $10,000 grant to update all of the uh, semester language from summer 2020 to fall 2020. That doesn't make any sense. And if you're doing just a regular course revision that has your OER stuff, it's it's not going to be something that we can do. We are covering the extra time it takes to revise OER to create new OER. And of course, ancillary materials that can be kind of in the air as many different things. But what we're saying here are these are the materials that supplement the instruction of a course using existing open educational resources. So you could, for example, uh, create New lecture slides, make them accessible, uh, provide some uh, a video set. Georgia Highlands has been really good at making video sets for uh, 
particular courses. That's been really nice to see. Um, improvements and adaptations on existing OER, another way that you could do that, uh, making a second edition of a text that maybe you created early on and you said, well, this could be a lot better. Or you could take the resources that you've provided, that you've created and provided for free in D2L and make them into an open textbook, but it would take a lot of work and your proposal is here is how that's going to happen. There are priority categories in these grant applications, but they are not grounds for either qualification or disqualification. So as I go through these, uh, know that if you don't meet any of these priority categories, you still have a great chance. Um, having a wonderful proposal is the biggest thing you need to do in order to uh, to receive an award. Um, these priority categories can help, but they only help a little bit. Uh, so we do encourage these. They meet strategic priorities of us and of the USG, but they are not grounds for disqualification. So as as I'm talking about these, just know that these are not exclusive things. So one of them is collaborative projects with professional support. This is for us to encourage um, more collaboration across roles with um, these projects. So yes, you are a team of three faculty members who are all teaching with these resources and you're going to make a substantial transformation. If you bring in an instructional designer, a librarian, uh, the publisher of an open educational resource like the UNG Press, uh, instructional technologists to help get uh, an application that you've wanted to build going, web designers for uh, a particular web tool that you want to create, uh, graphic designers to improve uh, the materials that you currently have. That is something that we prioritize here because we've seen a lot of success with these teams who bring somebody on in, in staff to kind of save you time by offering their expertise. Um, Librarians, for instance, can bring uh, disparate resources into one place very quickly, and they're great at finding materials uh, in a way that, uh, you know, that that's part of the profession. So it's really neat uh, to see uh, these, to see grant teams team up with uh, professional staff who can help out with this stuff. Um, student participation in materials creation, adaptation, and evaluation. So if you're involving students in the creation of materials, uh, editing them, remixing them, um, doing a substantial evaluation of an open textbook, that's a really cool way of doing this. And you're in doing so, you're letting students participate in a very meaningful way uh, towards teaching and learning. So that is one of these priorities. Departmental scaling, let's say that you've had a project in the past or you've just implemented OER on your own and you would like to bring this up to a department wide scale and your department says, yes, we are going to do that. Um, you have full agreement from your department that you're going to make uh, a change to all of the courses where they're going to teach with open, no cost or low cost materials, department wide, all sections. Um, you can then say that, yes, this is a departmental scaling project. Um, we do need to make sure that the department commits to at least pilot the project. Uh, if you apply for a departmental scaling project and we're like, great, that's that's awesome. Your entire department is going to try this out and then it doesn't happen because nobody buys in. Uh, that doesn't really bode well for uh, the results of the grant. So we need to make sure that the department has committed to these projects if you've got a departmental scaling one. Uh, it has to state that for sure. Uh, upper level campus collaborations. So this is the other one. Uh, this is about uh, strategic priority within ALG. So there are plenty of OER out there for introductory courses that are um, you know, high enrollment across the United States, across uh, North America. Uh, plenty in English language, of course. Uh, but when you get to upper level courses, more specific stuff, there's much less when it comes to OER. And you can see how that happens, right? Everybody takes some sort of introduction to psychology, but when you're planning on becoming a psychologist and you have a particular 
topic of interest, you're taking a course that's, you know, a, a small sliver of the broader stuff that you had studied in Introduction to Psychology, and it goes far in depth. You are affecting a lot less students by creating an open textbook in that field uh, when you're talking about potential impact. So big uh, nonprofits that had funded the creation of open textbooks, they really funded it for high enrollment courses. It's tougher up at the upper level. So we wanted to make sure that if you have a team that could um, even put together uh, an open course that uses disparate resources across the web to, uh, to satisfy all of the uh, learning outcomes of your course, or build an entire open textbook together because you've already got all of these materials somewhere and you just want to get them out into the open, you've already authored them, that's a great way of doing it too. Uh, so what we're suggesting here is collaboration between institutions because upper level courses usually do not have as high enrollment as the uh, intro level courses. So if you're able to link the efforts of a few um, institutions together, you can then affect enough students for this to really make a big impact throughout the USG. So that's what we mean by an upper level campus collaboration. It's not just that your course has an upper level course and that's your application. You have to have collaboration between at least you and another institution for upper level courses. And this means upper level undergrad, but it also means graduate courses and doctoral courses as well. So how does this all work? Well, let's say that you do get funded. Funding goes to the institution to cover that team's time and project expenses um, as given on the application and as agreed upon in our service level agreement. So the service level agreement is signed by the institution and it's signed by us. It's a deal between the University System of Georgia and the institution that the work on your project is going to happen. Uh, the statement of work is an appendix that's attached to the service level agreement, and it's kind of the substance of the whole thing. It is your proposal. It is the work that is going to be done. Once all of that is signed, 50% of the funds go to the institution to get this done. Um, once we receive the final report at the end, the other 50% is sent to the institution. Now, institutions are responsible for disbursing those funds. That includes salary, um, that includes expenses, travel reimbursement. Um, they are supported by state funds, so you, uh, your institution will be following uh, state board of regents and institutional guidelines and policies and procedures. Uh, because you are working with either a business office or a grants office on this, they usually know how to do this, and that's usually just fine. Um, be sure that everybody is checking over the service level agreement and that they really do agree to the terms of it. Uh, in round 19, we are looking to have a service level agreement that will look quite different from how it had been from round 18 all the way back to round one. We're trying to make it a little bit more clear how the mechanics of grant funding can work at an institution and what can and can't happen in the event of some, contingent, uh, some contingencies. Uh, for example, what if one of your team members suddenly disappears and maybe they're still at the institution, but they're not on the team? What happens? Uh, there's a lot of vague questions that kind of come up because of that. So this next service level agreement is going to try to uh, address those and give some best practices uh, to each office. So the next thing that we're going to do is uh, go into how to apply for these grants. Uh, first of all, you'll want to bookmark the round 19 request for proposals page. And I had already linked to this earlier, but there are some uh, notifications, of people joining the meeting and stuff. So I'm going to post this in the chat just one more time for you. Um, this is in our about section, but if you've got the link bookmarked, you'll know exactly where to go. Um, the first thing that you want to do is complete the word proposal on the RFP website. Um, make sure that you're filling out the right one. If you're doing a transformation project, it's the transformation one. If you're doing a continuous improvement project, there is a different one for that. Um, then after you're done with that Word document, then you're going through the submission process 
on the online form, which is done through Alchemer. Uh, we used to do this through Google Forms. It didn't do what we wanted. Uh, it didn't allow people to, for example, save their work for another time when they can come in and uh, finish an application. And so now we have a lot more uh, bells and whistles going on with this form. So here's a walkthrough of the Transformation Grants application. I am going to turn this over to our program manager, Tiffany Reardon. Uh, Tiffany, take it away. OK, cool. Um, I will switch our screen sharing. Uh, let's see, let's do this. Can you see my screen? Yep, we see it. OK, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, to get to the application, um, we're going to go to that round 19 request for proposals. Um, and it is linked down here under application process, the online application link. Um, you'll also find the word applications, though. So um, you'll want to, uh, you know, make sure that you read through the request for proposals document, read through the rubrics. Um, these are all word documents. Um, and uh, look at your Word application, which I already have open, so I'm just going to uh, open that real quick. Um, and so the Word, the Word documents have a little bit more uh, meat to them than what you're going to fill in on the uh, online form, um, and that's because you have narratives and things that you're going to need to write for this um, application. Tiffany? Yeah. Are you only sharing your browser window? Uh, yes, apparently. I yeah, am. we can't see the Word document. All right. Let me fix that. Um, this one. Is that better? There we go. Yep. OK. Yeah, so uh, like I said, the Word document, um, you're going to have to write like narratives and things. So this is definitely the first place you want to want to fill in, um, work on the Word document before you go into the online form. Um, because you can fill everything into this and then use this to fill in your online and then upload uh, the final version. Um, so we're going to ask for your, uh, your information as well as the submitter's information if it's different. So some institutions have a specified person who submits these for you. And then other institutions have you submit your own. Um, that really just depends on how your institution does it. But if you're submitting your own, you can either leave the submitter information blank or just put your information again. Um, that's fine too. You'll put all your team members in here. Um, and the uh, this is the transformation application. The continuous improvement one looks very similar with some things left out. Um, you'll indicate your priority category, your total funding. Um, the final semester for round 19 is going to be spring 2022. Um, so that's going to be your uh, only option for transformation grants. Um, your uh, uh, you'll also let us know if you're planning on using an OpenStax textbook. If you don't know that yet, that's fine. Um, this is just so that we can uh, give your information uh, to OpenStax so that they can give you some extra support um, where needed. Uh, you'll give us your course information. So for the transformation grants, we're going to ask for some pretty detailed uh, impact data. So you're, we're looking for your um, your course information, so title, number, uh, who's teaching this course. So if you're on a team, you're, uh, you may have different people teaching the same course in different ways, or you may have uh, everyone teaching it the same way, or you may be doing all totally different courses on the same grant. Um, it really depends on how you're doing this, on how you'll fill this out. But uh, the I think the best way to approach it is if you are if if your courses have completely different um, textbook costs, then it's safe to treat them as different courses, um, even if they are the same course taught by different people. If you have different 
textbooks, you know, maybe one course is teaching it with like a $50 textbook and another is teaching it with a $125 textbook. You'll, uh, I would treat those as separate courses. Um, but if you're teaching them with very similar textbook costs, maybe the same, then it's fine to put them all into the same one. Um, but we're going to ask for your enrollment. We're going to ask for it uh, separated by semester. So um, this is enrollment by section and then sections by summer, fall and spring. Um, then uh, you're, we're going to ask you to just add those up. Uh, so we want the whole year's number of sections. <clears throat> we're going to uh, ask for your total enrollment for the academic year. So the number of students per section multiplied by the sections per year. We're going to ask for the information about your original materials. So uh, what's the book? Uh, who's the author? And how much does it cost purchased from either your campus bookstore, the publisher, or Amazon? Um, with a, We want you to give us the link to that uh, book showing us the price because sometimes, uh, sometimes the uh, prices are look very different in different places and we just want to see where you're getting your number from. Um, if you have multiple texts, put them all in this section. Um, so list e each of the uh, each of the textbooks or each of the materials, and then you can add up the costs of them all in the uh, the next section. So original cost per student section enrollment. So how much does each student pay? Um, we're going to ask for your your expected cost um, after the project. So if you're aiming to switch to no cost, then you're going to put zero here. If you're aiming to switch to a low cost homework solution or a low cost textbook, something under $40, then you'll put that here. Um, we just want to know your plan for uh, after you finish the project. And then uh, we want you to calculate the savings. So you're going to take the uh, uh, the amount that students will pay after the project is over, um, subtracted from what they were what what they were paying before, and then uh, and then you'll multiply that by the number of students per year to give us a total uh, projected savings. And you'll do that for each course on your project. So we do get some teams that will. Uh, apply for these with like four or five different courses um, and they're uh, a lot of the time those are for uh, like if they're planning on trying to get the whole degree to be no cost you would put e put the information for each course separately um, that that helps us get our our data organized um, and limits any uh, calculation errors um, but you'll fill all that in here in the Word document. We've given you space for four, um, but if you need to add more, there will be a, uh, you can copy and paste the table over and over in the Word document, um, but uh, you'll also have an opportunity to add more than uh, what's uh, available by default in the online form. Um, we're going to ask for your project goals. So, uh, and this is beyond just the cost savings. So, we want to know what your goals are for savings, student success, materials creation, um, and any ped pedagogical transformation goals. Um, and so, this is a good place to talk about um, overall goals for the course. Maybe like, how does uh, what does the department want to get out of it? Um, any any goals that you have for this project beyond just trying to save students money? Um, we want to know about those here. <clears throat> um, we also want a statement of transformation. So what are you, you know, what's the current state and what are you going to do? So um, we want to know uh, what, describe what you, what you can about the course, um, how it's situated in the department, in the institution, any relevant information there, and then uh, explain what you're going to do and how it's going to impact that course, department, and institution uh, 
how it's going to impact all of that information that you gave us in um, the previous uh, section. Um, it's important to do a little bit of research um, if you can about how that how the this project is going to impact that stuff, the uh, impact the course, the department institution. Um, so look at, you, you know, look at scholarly literature. Um, there's tons of stuff out there on how uh, OER and and uh, uh, open projects affordability and things impact um, uh, education. So um, try to take a look at that, see what you can, uh, you know, find what you can see what kind of um, impact you might even see that maybe you didn't think about for your project. Um, your action plan, this is where you're going to get in detail on what your project is, how it's going to go, what each person is going to do, um, things like that. So you're going to, uh, you're going to, this is where you're going to detail your uh, project management plan, basically. So um, how, how are you going to make this happen? There will also be a section for your timeline. So um, this is more getting in detail on um, what's going to need to be done throughout this project. So uh, you're going to get tell us the roles um, and what each person on your team is going to be doing, how long, um, at least something, a little bit of an estimate of how long each task is going to take. So this doesn't have to be a perfect estimate, but try to think through, um, you know, how long it's going to take each person to do each thing, you know, an estimated number of hours. Um, that's helpful to the reviewers um, in evaluating the appropriateness of the uh, the amount of funding that you're requesting. So that's why we request that. That's why we ask for it. A lot of reviewers will actually look for that and um, uh, use that as a starting point of trying to evaluate that. Um, you're also going to try to do some research on what's already out there for your course. So, uh, you know, do a preliminary uh, search for what your options might be. Um, you know, the, look at whether there's an OpenStax textbook that you might look at or other open textbooks out there or uh, other materials, common materials in your area that are uh, available. Um, try to do a little bit of research, a preliminary review of what is out there um, and maybe, you know, maybe a couple of the first places you might look if awarded the project. Um, you're going to give a plan for the selection, adoption, adaptation, and or creation. So um, we want, uh, this is where you're going to get in detail on the actual project. So are you adopting a textbook? Are you creating a new textbook? Are you revising something? Um, that's where you're going to talk about that. Um, you're going to also give a plan for how you're going to make it work in your course. So talk about the instructional design of your course. How are you going to align to your uh, course objectives and, uh, you know, what kinds of changes are you going to need to make on your, you know, on the course side of things. Um, and then you want to make sure to include a plan for how you're going to provide open access to any new materials that you create. That's because these grants do require that anything new that you create is going to be made openly available. So you'll either host it openly um, on your own somewhere outside of the learning management system, um, or you can plan on just uh, sending them to us for us to host in our repository. Um, which we will do either way, um, but it's important to have that plan in there for how you plan on sharing these materials uh, outside of your institution. Um, it's a good idea to try to try to look into uh, open licensing and do a little bit of research on that and how that uh, your plans for that as well. Creative Commons is a good place to start. Um, 
You're also going to uh, think about quantitative and qualitative measures. So we are going to ask you for measures on student satisfaction, student performance, and course retention. Um, but there are different ways that you can do that. So uh, this could be um, it, the course retention is is going to be uh, based on the uh, drop fill withdrawal rates, but uh, as far as satisfaction and performance goes, that may be, uh, you know, it could be a survey, it could be like a, a focus group interview type thing. It, it really just depends on what works best for your course. So um, there are different ways to do this. We just want to know your plan. Um, it's also a good opportunity for you to think about and look into whether you're going to need IRB approval for this information too. So you should look at that, talk to your institution's um, IRB and, and find out uh, what's going to be needed on that side of things as well and let us know that in your application. Um, you'll go in detail um, on your timeline and this actually says Google Forms but you can ignore that. Um, but uh, just give us a, a list of um, the the schedule for your project, the timeline for your project. So, um, you know, when are you going to have things due? Uh, when are you going to do like revision or um, when are you going to post it online? Things like that. There are lots of examples of timelines. If you look through old proposals um, on on our website through previous rounds, that's a good place to um, find some examples for how people have organized their timelines. Um, you're also going to give us a budget, a uh, broken down budget. So you've already given us the mac, the uh, total amount that you're asking for. Um, but we, in this section, we want to know uh, how that breaks down. So um, uh, tell us how much is going to 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 what. You know how 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 much are you allocating to a to each team member for is it salary or travel is it um you know are you gonna hire a student assistant are you going to purchase materials things like that break that down here and um to uh that's also so that the reviewers can uh look at the uh look at the budget in comparison to the project that you're proposing um you're also going to give us a sustainability plan. So um, this is thinking about beyond the project. So uh, what's your plan for making sure that things stay updated? Um, what's your plan for making sure links aren't broken? Things like that. Um, and uh, and then you'll also think about what your uh, what kinds of plans you have for the future for uh, like, do you plan on going to conferences and presenting your work? Do you plan on doing research? Things like that. Um, you know, is there a possibility that this could be expanded to, to more course, uh, more courses in the department? Um, uh, things like that. Um, we're going to have you uh, on in the online forum. You're going to have a box where you have to check that um, uh, any new materials are de by default made by uh, made available under a CC by license, um, except for materials with a pre-existing um, license that might be a little bit more restrictive, like a share alike, um, and uh, uh, all of that information um, can be th there's information on our website there's information on creative commons you'll also go through a training on how all of that stuff works if your um, uh, if your proposal is accepted um, you're also going to say that you agree that all of your materials will be created with accessibility in mind which you'll also go through training on so um, you will have adequate support to make sure that all of your materials um, can be developed with accessibility standards in mind. And then you're going to get get two two different letters. So we want um, one letter from your department chair or if your department chair is on the project, their direct report uh, uh, 
so that you know that may be the dean it may be the provost um it just kind of depends on how your institution organizes things but um most of the time this is going to be the department chair um we're looking for a letter of support here so we want um uh their support for the project itself so they agree that this is you know that they, they have they support this project and um agree that this course that this is going to happen um there you're also uh so yeah approve of the work you're also going to ask them to acknowledge the sustainability of it so um mostly we're just looking for a, a statement saying that you know they they support uh, your continued use of the, the materials after the project um we we really just want to we just want to see that there that there's no plan for like a required commercial textbook uh in the near future and which would negate your uh, all of your good work and so um that's kind of what we're looking for there just a general support letter um if you are uh um it, the funds disbursement uh may it may not actually have any connection to your department chair it might um but they should provide that support as well so support that the the uh, support for dispersing funding um through whatever office it needs to be dispersed through um, that's going to be the letter of support that holds a little bit more of the meat. The other letter of support we're looking for is from your grants or business office. Just, uh, just acknowledging, so this is a letter of acknowledgement, not support, but just acknowledging that they have seen the pro that they've seen the proposal, they've talked to you, um, they are aware of your applying. Um, and this is to help you get connected with your um, grants or business office. Uh, before being awarded the project so that there are no um, uh, surprises. So um, that's your transformation one. The continuous improvement um, is very similar, has only a few differences. Um, and so the first, the, the big difference is that you're not going to go into detail on your uh, course, de your course information. So your, um, uh, that, that impact data, the cost of the textbook and things like that, because for these projects, ideally you're coming from a course that already uses open or affordable materials and you're here to improve them. Um, your final semester looks different, so you have an option of fall or spring, uh, fall 2021 or spring 2022 on the continuous improvement projects because they tend to be a little bit um, smaller, so you may be able to finish early, earlier than the other projects. Um, you are going to give us the information for what your, um, what your, uh, revising or updating and so um, this could be a previous a, a textbook that you created on a previous grant um, it could be something that's already out there and you're going to revise it um, you're going to put put a link to that information um, in the in your application here you're still going to have project goals you're still going to have an action plan uh, you're still going to have a timeline and a budget. You're still going to agree to the Creative Commons terms and the accessibility terms. You're still going to have a letter of support and you're still going to have a letter of acknowledgement. So all of that stuff is still going to be there. It's just a little bit shorter of an application um, with a few things um, condensed a little bit. Um, so your online form. Um, uh, oh, we switched to an acknowledgement form. I'm sorry. So the acknowledgement letter of acknowledgement, um, we have a form for them to fill out. Sorry about that, Jeff. Um, I didn't realize we had this up yet. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was sorry. just I was answering things answering in line at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't, I, I didn't realize that we already had this form up here. That letter of acknowledgement in the word form is referring to the acknowledgement form. I think 
either one is fine. If they want to write us a letter, that's fine. You can also just have them sign this um, saying that they have taught that they've talked to you. But either way, you're going to submit it with your application. And then finally, you just have your online uh, application. And so you can find that on the RFP page. It's at the very bottom of the application process. Um, and this is your form. So you're going to fill this out with the information that you had in your Word form. So um, just to show you kind of how this goes. Um, this out because these are required sections and it won't let me move forward if I don't put this put stuff in here. And so you're going to fill things out the same way that you did on your word. All of this information was stuff that we put in on the word form, except that here it's getting a little smart. So is the person submitting the form the same as the applicant? And so in this case, yes, if you have uh, someone else on, at your institution who submits this, that person is going to say no, and then they'll fill in their own information. Fill in the team member information. Um, sorry, except for the applicant. So if you are the only person on this project, you do not have to put your information again, but if you have multiple other team members, so let's say that Jeff is on my team. Um, you would list them here. If you have more team members, you can add them. Uh, it's not very it's not very common to have more than 10 team members. Um, but if you do, that's OK and you can put them in this box. And then it's going to ask you which kind of grant you are applying for. I'm going to select transformation because that's the one that has the um, the data section. The continuous improvement one won't be that much different, um, except that it is going to except that it won't have that course data information. Which is here. So notice the online form is a little prettier than the word one as far as filling in your course data. It's a nice little table easy to fill out. So you're going to put in your course number. Um, so this is going to be. Um, uh, let's let's go with my. Course that I used to teach at KSU. Um, so you put your course number in there. Um, average pre transformation will say 125 post zero. Um, per student cost saving, so that would be 125 per student. Average students per spring semester, so we're going to say, um, let's see if I teach two courses in spring at 25, we'll just say 50. And you'll fill them in um, for each semester. <clears throat> Notice that this is students per spring semester, so um, we do want it want the student number, not the sections. You're going to put in your course title and numbers. Um, so this is technical writing. Um, you'll select your priority categories. So we, uh, Jeff talked about the four different priority categories we have. Um, you'll select if you have one. If not, then you would just leave this section blank. Um, and then you'll confirm that you do, your project will end in spring 2022 with the submission of the final report. So um, that's the semester you would be teaching the course in is spring 2022. Tell us whether you're using OpenStax and then give us the amount of requested funding. So I'm only, uh, let's see, Jeff is on my team. So we'd be two people. We're going to say that we want $10,000. And then you're going to put do your uh, file upload. So you'll give the information about um, who wrote your letter of support. So uh, your department chair, your dean, whoever wrote that letter. Um, give us that information. 
that's who your sponsor is. And then um, you're going to upload the Word application. So that was the other uh, application that we uh, looked at. So this thing that we filled in, you're going to upload that here. You're going to upload your letter of support, and then you're going to upload your acknowledgement form from the grants or business office, the grants or business office, uh, which is going to make me put stuff in here. So Jeff is my Jeff is going to be my sponsor. And just and in just case, case um, we, are we are recording this, this and it and will it be will listed, be listed on, on the RFP page. page. So yes. if, if you're, you're unable, unable to, to go, go uh, further than three o'clock, then, then thank you for you being here. But we're going to uh, keep going, going, going through this until the end, the end for those of you who can. Yes. Sorry I took so long, guys. Oh, oh it's no problem. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you submit your application, it's going to give you a big summary of everything that you put in. So you can review that. Make sure it all looks good. If you need to go back, you can hit back. Um, if you're ready, though, you can submit it. And it's just going to give you the thank you notice. Um, and it should give you, uh, it should send you an email with um, uh, a confirmation email. I'm not sure if it gives you a. Um, yeah, it should give out. you a list of all of your responses. Hmm, there you go. So this is what your, um, your confirmation email looks like. So you'll be able to get that as well in your email. If you don't find it, check your junk mail. Hopefully it won't go there though. Um, I think that's, am I doing any other walkthroughs? I don't think so. No, I think that's about it. I mean, the continuous improvement grant process is the same. You go to the same form, but then you select that it is a continuous improvement grant. Um, and you have to fill out less stuff there when you do that because you're not transforming courses and you're not putting in student savings data. Uh, so you'll go more quickly towards the uploading stuff if you're uh, doing the continuous improvement one. Yes. And that's all we've got uh, today. Uh, I just wanted to open up uh, the uh, sound channels for questions, but before then be sure to take a look at the chat. Um, we had plenty of good questions here. Uh, one was, does the course have a required start time or semester? And they do not. You can start earlier than the final semester if you would like, but they need to be implemented by at least the final semester of the project. Um, for the continuous improvement grant, uh, would a collaborator be a team member? Like if you brought in an instructional designer or a librarian, uh, yes, they would be a team member on that application. Um, there are no limits on the length of the narrative sections of the grant application. Uh, Google Forms in, uh, kind of imposed this on us, and that's one of the reasons why we moved. Um, there is a preference regarding who writes the letter of support, but it depends on who the project lead is. If the project lead is a faculty member within a department, then the department chair would be the one running the letter of support. If you are the department chair, it might be the dean. Um, if it's the dean who's the, the uh, project lead, it might be going all the way up to VPAA slash provost. So it's always a, a level of supervision, a direct report above um, the project lead. Uh, the Word document is submitted through the online form. I think we uh, reached that in the walkthrough. Um, we do recommend getting in contact with the Grants and Business Office first. Of course, we uh, require it now. And if you have questions about HR at that point, sometimes they'll be able to answer those. And if they can't, then I think they'd work with you and HR on uh, an answer to your question, depending on the institution. Um, it, be sure to budget the maximum per member at 2000 and the uh, uh, how staff are compensated within grants will differ by institution. All right, so that's the chat. We, Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, we did. Um, we didn't get to go in detail through the rubrics, but those rubrics are available on the RFP page. So if you have any questions about those, just let us know. Um, but the word word versions of those rubrics are up there for you to look at. Yep, we added just a little bit here about teaching and learning impact uh, as opposed to previous rounds. Uh, they're weighted times two on the points that are awarded uh, from five from one to five. 
And you'll see that in both of the rubrics, both the continuous improvement and the transformation one. So it's not just about student savings, of course. It is also about teaching and learning, and that's why we did that. OK, uh, so it is about 3.03. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, have an excellent day. And if you have any questions, uh, be sure to contact us at jeff.gallant at usg.edu and tiffany.reardon at usg.edu. Uh, be sure to include both of us uh, so we can both gather our, our thoughts on it. Thanks so much, and I'm really looking forward to some great applications. It's awesome to see so many people here today. Stopping yes. it now. Thanks, everyone.